Okay, so we're taking a further look at uh, trigonometric substitution here. We're trying to find integrals. And so, again, we've been through this process a few times. You're like, oh, yeah, if I got a number, take away x squared. Right? We've taken a look at this before, and it's also the same as uh, when we were trying to find uh, the area of that circle. Right, we say, hey, the hypotenuse will have to be three, right? Because nine is obviously the hypotenuse squared, right? Because I've got a squared plus b squared is c squared. And if there's subtraction going on, we're finding one of the legs. So the hypotenuse, of course, has to be three. The leg has to be x. And this is just like our previous example, and it's also just like the finding the area of the circle example. Our leftover side, of course, will be that crazy square root with the 9 minus x squared inside. Of course, if we want to have an expression that only uses x, we're thinking, hey, x is opposite theta so we can use opposite hypotenuse that's sine so the sine of theta of course has to be x over three hypotenuse over i'm sorry look, opposite side over hypotenuse so if i want to substitute for x i can multiply by three and say oh that's right x is just three times the sine of theta And of course, I'm like, well, that takes care of the x, but, uh, huh, right? We got a dx situation going on, right? So inside the square root, we're, we're set with that. And of course, we can do a little manipulation here, right? 3 times 3 is 9. Sine theta times sine theta is sine squared theta. Factor out the 9. And, of course, we've played this game a few times. We know that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta has to equal 1. So I can replace that number 1 with sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. And we see a nice little cancellation in there. Right? This has happened with each of the examples, and we're finding the area of the circle. We're like, hey, we keep ending up with a number we can take the square root of. In this case, square root of 9 is 3. And we keep getting cosine squared theta. We take the square root, we get cosine theta, right? We, we seem to be getting this like every time. And then when we go for that dx finally, right? We say, hey, let's take the derivative of x with respect to theta. The 3 will sit there because it's a coefficient. Derivative of sine of theta is cosine theta. Multiply both sides by d theta. And you're like, hey, this happens every single time. Notice that 3 with the dx matches the 3 we got from the previous substitution. The cosine theta matches the cosine theta we had previously done. So the only thing we're really picking up here is a d theta. Right? So this has happened like every single time. Now, really, to speed things up, right? If you know 2 plus 3 is 5... You know, 5 minus 3 is 2. Titan! Hush! So, if we know sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1, right, this should be an automatic. This is not something we should have to figure out every single time. You say, hey, if I see 1 minus sine squared theta, it's going to be cosine squared theta. Right? So that's a trade we should really be getting down to, you know, rote memory. It's like, hey, I've seen this before. I know what it's going to be. And so when we do the substitution, again, every single time we've done this, we've got in a coefficient times cosine theta times that same coefficient times cosine theta with a d theta. Right? We keep getting that same result over and over. Of course, that will become 9 cosine squared theta. And then every single time when we get here, we say, that's right. I can go look at my double and half angles. And when I look at my double and half angles, specifically the double angle formulas, I'm like, hey, 
there is a, an equation there that involves cosine squared theta, right? Actually, there's two of them, but I want to pick the one that does not involve sine squared theta. So I'm like, oh yeah, if I've got a cosine squared theta, I can change it for an expression that involves cosine of two theta instead. All right, I can say, hey, if I got cosine squared theta, I can trade it for one half times the quantity one plus cosine of two theta. All right, we've done this like every single time. Did a little bit of multiplying there, right? Nine times a half. And so when we integrate, the one, of course, will just become theta. If we integrate cosine, of course, it becomes sine. But since it was a cosine of two theta, when it becomes sine of two theta, right, we're doing the chain rule backward, right? A u substitution, that's where that one half on the sine of two theta is coming from, right? If we're doing the chain rule, we would have multiplied by two. Since we're going backward, we have to multiply by the reciprocal, one half. Right, and again, if you want to see it step by step, their step by step is where that one half comes from with a u substitution. And of course, if we got sine of two theta, that can be traded for two sine of theta, cosine theta. Right, because in this case, notice instead of limits of integration, we actually need to get it back to x. And so that's why we have to make this trade. We don't have to make that trade if we're trying to do an integral where we have the limits of integration, because then we can plug and chug. But here it's like, no, I gotta have a way of getting back to x, because the original equation was in terms of x. And I need to make that substitution because remember when we drew our triangle, it was not in terms of two theta, it was just in terms of theta. And so if I wanna backtrack, I say, oh yeah, sine of theta would be the x over three. Cosine of theta is that crazy, crazy square root of nine minus x squared all over three. And then of course theta would be the arc sine of x over three, right? I have to do the inverse sine function there. And this is very similar to what we saw before. And of course I can do a couple of simplifying steps, all right? Three times three made that nine on that denominator. I can use the distributive property. And now I say, hey, look, I got a nine and a nine that can cancel out. And so again, just like with that previous example, that nine inside that square root symbol at the very, very beginning of the question, that nine reappears in our answer. Square root of nine happens to be three. Notice a three appears in our answer, All right? And once again, we've got some twos for denominators, right? So that nine over two, that two's always there. The nine happened to come from the original square root. Arc sine will always be there. X over three, that's because with the X squared, it becomes X. The nine, the square root becomes three. Plus sine will always be there. We're always gonna have a fraction. It's always gonna be over two. Square root of X squared is where that X came from. Notice that original square root is still there. That'll always happen. And then of course there's that plus C. So let's go for a brand new example. And you're like, whoa, this one is different, right? Because before it was a number minus x squared. So that number was always the hypotenuse squared. Notice that this time x is the hypotenuse, right? Because it's x squared minus a leg squared. So when I draw my triangle, it's the hypotenuse that will be x. 
and then I can make the opposite side 2 because, of course, 2 times 2 makes 4. Now, you're like, hey, how come he put that 2 on that leg? All right? The X for the hypotenuse is not a surprise, but why did he put a 2 on that leg? Again, we could have put it on either leg. And if I put it on one leg, we'll be using sine. If I put it on the other leg, we'll be using cosine. And you'll find out for uh, in a minute why I chose to put it where it would be associated with cosine instead of sine. And, of course, we've got that weird extra side. Right? The cosine uses adjacent and hypotenuse. So cosine of theta will be 2 divided by x. Oh, good grief. I don't want x in the denominator. All right? That's a disaster waiting to happen. So let's multiply both sides by x. And then we could divide both sides of cosine of theta. Or we could say, hey, uh, come on, get a clue. All right? The reciprocal of cosine is secant. So I could multiply both sides by x and then divide both sides by cosine of theta. But you're like, hey, uh, you know what we're going to do? Oh, and then we'd have to divide both sides by 2, wouldn't we, if we went that route? Like, woo! It's a lot quicker to just say, hey, no, if we, if we want x in the numerator, we just want to use the reciprocal. And, of course, the reciprocal of cosine theta is secant theta. All right? That's one of their those identities we should have memorized. Multiply both sides by 2. Ta-da! We got x equals 2 secant of theta. So, if I know that 2 secant theta is x, inside that square root symbol, I can make that substitution. I've now got 4 secant squared theta minus 4. Factor out the 4. I'm like, hmm, secant squared theta minus 1. Okay, so I go back to my cornerstone. Sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. Divide everything by cosine squared theta. Ooh, tangent squared theta plus 1 is secant squared theta. Of course, if I subtract 1 from each side, I now know that tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta minus 1. Of course, instead of deriving that, if uh, you know where to look on your trigonometry reference guide, that is one of the Pythagorean identities. Right, that tangent squared theta plus 1 is secant squared theta. Of course, I can take the square root. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of tangent squared theta is just tangent theta. But this is why I want to use cosine instead of sine. It's a little easier to manipulate because the cosine becomes secant when we do the reciprocal. And then when I'm playing with the identity, I can use tangent squared to go along with the secant squared. Just a little bit more friendly than using the cotangent squared and the cosecant squared. Especially when it comes time to integrate. All right, so I've got that part, but I also need my dx. So if I take the derivative of secant theta, it becomes secant theta tangent theta. Right, derivative of secant is secant tangent. I should have that one memorized. Multiply both sides by d theta. Now I've got my dx. And so when I integrate, I've got a 2 times tangent of theta times a 2 secant theta tangent theta. Which becomes 4 secant theta times tangent squared theta. Notice that I did not erase our identity that we just used a moment ago. So I can substitute again. But I'm going the opposite direction this time. I say, hey, uh, guess what? Tangent squared theta is secant squared theta minus 1. And I end up with 4 secant cubed theta minus secant theta d theta. And guess what? Our toolbox does not have a tool that we can use 
to perform this integration. The mystery thickens. We're stuck. Right? So the first example you looked at, we were successful. The second example that we looked at, we were successful. Notice in both cases, inside the square root, it was a number minus x squared. And a plain old number was in the hypotenuse. Here, our third example, it was x squared minus 4. x became the hypotenuse, and we got to a place where we could draw the triangle. We can make a substitution for x. We can make a substitution for dx. But we were not able to integrate. Fourth example. You ready for the spoiler alert? Right? The other thing that could happen is there could be a plus sign inside. And of course, with addition, it doesn't matter if the number comes first or the x squared comes first. Because with addition, uh, the commutative and associative properties allow us to add in either direction. And spoiler alert. When we get that plus, yeah, it's a little bit different, but guess what? We're also going to be unable to integrate. So you're like, oh, so of the three possible situations, right? If we're subtracting the hypotenuse squared from a side squared, or if we're subtracting the side squared from the hypotenuse squared, or in this last example, if we've got side squared plus side squared, which means that resulting thing is hypotenuse, those are the three things that could end up. If we did happen to have something like this with the plus sign in the middle, spoiler alert, we're not going to integrate, but you know what we could do? We can still draw the triangle. We can still find a substitution for x. We can still find the substitution for dx, and we can still rewrite the integral in terms of d theta. And then we will stop, because we will not be able to integrate it. But we can get everything set up. And this will also be your goal on the assignment today. All right? You'll draw the triangle. You'll find the substitution for x. You'll find the substitution for dx. You'll rewrite the integral in terms of d theta, and then you will stop. Okay, so the goals for this example and for the worksheet. On the worksheet, you'll notice that a few of the questions are able to be completed with the math tools in your toolbox. However, with every single question, I just want you to practice rewriting the integral. All right, just rewrite the integral. And of course, the big thing is we know we're going to draw a right triangle. We know we're going to have the, the, the right angle. We know we're going to place theta. How do we label the sides? Right? That's almost the big mystery. Say, so, well, if a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I know the hypotenuse is the square root of a squared plus b squared. So we are looking at the hypotenuse inside that integral. All right, that square root of x squared plus 36 has to be my hypotenuse. So what are the legs? Well, x squared means one of the legs was x. 36, also known as 6 squared, means the other leg was 6. Now, we don't want to use that crazy looking hypotenuse. So we want opposite over adjacent, so we want tangent. And since we want x in the numerator, I will make x opposite, right? I could have switched the places of the x and the 6, but then x would not be in the numerator if I decide to use the tangent function. x would have been in the denominator, and so to rewrite that, we'd end up be using cotangent. Right? The reason why I prefer using secant and tangent when we're doing the integration is that we uh, 
avoid using the negative symbols, right? When we got the cosecant and the cotangent, we start talking about integrating and taking derivatives. Then we got to keep track of whether or not we're supposed to switch between positive and negative. That's why I prefer to use secant instead of cosecant and why I prefer to use tangent instead of cotangent. So my first goal was accomplished. I've got the triangle, right? Goal number one was draw the triangle, label it. Goal number two, what is my substitution for X? All right, well, if tangent of theta, bum, 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 is X over six, X is just gonna be, let's multiply both sides by six. X is just six times the tangent of theta. So there's goal number two. I know what to substitute for X. Goal number three. Ooh, I'm gonna actually jump down to part of goal number four, right? Where we wanna integrate, we wanna rewrite the integral. All right, I'm gonna say, hey, I, I, I can trade that out, right? I can trade that out. X squared becomes six tangent theta squared. Of course, six times six is 36. Tangent theta times tangent theta is tangent squared theta. Factor out the 36. And man, I, I hope this stuff's getting memorized because I'm staring at tangent squared theta plus one. That's secant squared theta, All right? That's on your reference guide. Of course, square root of 36 is six. Square root of secant squared theta is secant theta. So that part of the integral is rewritten, right? Okay, back to step number three. What are we going to substitute for your friend and mine dx, right? Because I'm going from x to theta. So what are we going to do for dx? Well, we got to take the derivative of our equation for x. And of course, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So dx can be traded for six secant squared theta d theta. So goal number three is accomplished. I've got the substitution for dx. Part of goal four was already done. Let's finish it off, all right? So we already figured out the six times the secant of theta. Now we can make that substitution for 6 secant squared theta d theta. And so the fourth goal is accomplished. The integral is written in terms of d theta, right? And of course, at this point in time, we are going to, no, not post. Rearrange those letters, please. We are going to. No, we're not going to pot. So let's rearrange the letters again. <laughs> Spot. It's still not right. Let's scramble those letters one last time. Tops. Okay, no, let's, let's try this one last time. Ops. Uh, yeah, like I'm going to opt not to do this. He opts to use. Ah, get that out of here. Stop. That's what we're going to do. We accomplished goals one, two, three, four. We are going to stop. Bum, bum, bum. So today's worksheet on each question. We want to draw and label that triangle as nicely as we can. We want to find the substitution for X. We want to find the substitution for DX. And then we just want to rewrite the integral in terms of DX. And then we will stop. All right, we're not going to actually do any integration today. We're just working with the substitutions. We're just working with the trigonometry. Woohoo, trigonometry, our favorite. And again, some of those integrals, you're like, oh, we can do this one. Please don't, just, just rewrite it and stop. Oh, I'm telling you, sometimes cows have the best views and the best property. There is a cow with a scenic view.